All right, welcome back. Um, oops, that might be a problem. Let's hope the slides don't short out. Um, all right, so we're changing gears slightly today. Um, up to this point, well, last three weeks with Jenny, you've been asking a question about the nature of the self. Um, what kind of thing am I? Am I just a computing machine? Am I something other than that? And the lectures and the readings, the assignments thus far, uh, have been geared towards answering that particular question. Uh, wherever you settle on that particular question, um, we still need to raise a further question. W whatever you are, whatever kind of thing you happen to be, um, you're also the same thing over time. You were born at a time. Uh, you had certain experiences. You went through... Um, primary school, secondary school, now you're getting your tertiary education. It's you all along the way. You were the person who was born, you were the person in primary, you were the person in secondary. Now you're here. You, you, you. But what makes it the case that we can truly say it's you who were born then and it's you who went to primary school and it's you, right? What explains this fact, right? It's a fact we all take for granted. And we take it for granted in a variety of different ways, not just in thinking about our personal pasts as our pasts, um, but we hold each other accountable for things. Um, if someone uh, gives you a black eye, you hold them responsible. But the person who um, stands before you well after the punch uh, is strictly speaking distinct in a lot of ways from the person who punched you, right? The person who punched you was engaged in a punching. The person who's standing in front of you after the fact is no longer engaged in a punching. Uh, the person who punched you was near you, but the person who uh, is uh, uh, standing before you post-punch might be about to run away real quick, something that's not true of the punching person, right? There's all sorts of differences. And as you look at individuals over time, you see many, many other differences. So what is it that makes one person the same person across all this stuff? Now, I got a bit ahead of myself. Uh, I was supposed to uh, give an announcement. Um, if you're interested in mentorship, uh, there's mentorship opportunities. Uh, there's more details on this slide. It'll be up on Moodle uh, for you to read later. All right. So back to philosophy. Um, okay. Oh, um, right. Uh, many, many other ways in which we presuppose this. Uh, if you catch uh, a criminal 10 years after their crime, you say things like, you committed that crime. You deserve to be punished, right? Again, this assumption is just present. Here's something uh, we not uncommonly hear. Um, <laughs> at least uh, we not uncommonly hope to hear from some people whom we hope would be a bit different. Uh, I'm not the same person I was then, right? I'm different. I'm a different person. Now, if true, does that mean that person shouldn't be held responsible for the actions uh, they committed? in the past. What do you think? If it's, if it's genuinely true to ever claim, I'm not the same person I was, does that mean you're off the hook? So the, the comment's interesting because uh, you um, went to cases where we want to say 
some of them might not actually have been fully responsible for the actions they committed because they were ignorant of certain things. But just take a jerk, right? They're just, <laughs> they're just interested in, you know, being a jerk, and they know they're a jerk. It's just, it makes life more convenient, it's more enjoyable for them, so they act jerkishly. Um, that kind of explanation. But here's, um, w what does it mean when you say you're not the same person? Do you really mean you're not the same person? Right, you're an entirely different individual, like your brother, right? Like you're that different? No, no, what you mean is something more like this. Um, my character's changed. My values have shifted. Um, how I'm going to interact with people from now on is not uh, how I would have acted um, in the past. Right? You're just making a claim about personality shift. And when we're talking about personal identity, we're not actually talking about personality in any particular way. Right? We, we have to uh, separate these two things just because they're distinct. The kind of person you are in this sense, the values you have, how you interact with people, the things you're able to do, the things you're willing to do, the things you would choose to do. Um, yeah, these are all facts about you. But they can change, and you remain the same person. They can change dramatically, right? People have conversion experiences and become very different people than they once were. Um, yet they're the same person. So the, the question we're asking isn't about personality shift or value shift or anything like that. Okay. Um, it's helpful, I think, to relate this question to... Um, a general question about composition. Right, physical objects have physical parts, right? And the parts, physical parts of physical objects occupy space. Right? And so you could look at any physical object around and just carve it up, conceptually anyway, into spatial parts. Right? My water bottle, which you might not be able to see. Um, right? It has parts. And there's the top, there's the bottom, there's the middle, there's the lid, etc. Uh, all the parts come together to form a whole, right? The the whole water bottle. Right, same thing with personal identity. You've got your earlier selves, and you have, hopefully we'll have later selves. Let's hope uh, we make it through this class. Uh, we want to know what unites them. Okay. Uh, any questions about the question? Great. It's always good when we know just what question we're asking. Uh, now, in talking about personal identity, um, two notions of identity have to be distinguished. Um, look at the coins, or the uh, uh, images of coins on the slide here. Um, are they the same? Are they identical? There's no trick, in, there's no like drawing in one coin that's not present in the other. Right? This isn't a I'm not playing a game. Um, well, you want to say, in a sense, yes, right? They're the same kind of coin, right? They've got the same image, the same coloring. They're both outlined in the same border, etc. cetera. Um, but in another sense, they're not the same thing, right? If you had the option of having two $2 coins rather than one, you'd be better off, right? You'd have more money, even though there's a sense in which they're the same. All right, so this is the difference between qualitative identity and numerical identity. Um, qualitative identity just has to do with sharing a lot of the same properties. Whenever you have two coins of the same denomination, um, uh, denomination, domination, denomination, denomination, I think that's the right. Um, whenever you have two $2 coins, uh, they have got all sorts of things in common, right? Weight, material, uh, where they're useful to be spent, um, on and on. Right? You can take the time to enumerate all the similarities. Uh, yet there's things that they don't share. Right? They, don't share they don't occupy the same space. Right? You can't have two coins that occupy exactly the same region of space. Um, they're not made of exactly the same material. Right? You can't have two coins that are made of exactly the same particles. Right? It's always going to be different particles. Um, there's going to be all sorts of differences. Right? One will be in one pocket, one might be in the other, one, right, etc. Uh, numerical identity is the contrast. Uh, two things are numerically identical if they're the very same thing. There's no difference. Right. 
So this is not like having two coins that are of the same kind. This is like Clark Kent and Superman. Right? They're identical in this sense. They're the very same person. There's nothing that's true of one that's not true of the other. Everything that's a property of one is a property of the other. If you get Clark Kent and Superman in a room, and there's no other people in the room, you still only have one person in the room. You have them always located at the same region of space. You always have them performing the same actions. They always have the same, because they're numerically identical, right? There's just one. Um, any questions about this relationship? The difference between numerical and qualitative? Good, all right. So uh, we can illustrate this further, right? It's not just Clark Kent and Superman, but there's all sorts of person, Batman, Bruce Wayne, Charles Dodgson, Lewis Carroll. Um, look at the last two. Heat is identical with molecular motion. Light is identical with electromagnetic radiation. There's a difference between these last two and the first ones. So what's the difference? Let me turn to the person next to you and say your thought. All right, uh, what do you think? Uh, a pseudonym, so just going by a different name. That It's true, you have to have certain information to be able to appreciate the identity. But the identity statement's true even if you're ignorant of the identity statement. Right? If you don't, uh, like Lois Lane, presumably, uh, well, in the fiction, in the story, she is uh, ignorant of the identity. Right? She doesn't know. Right? So if she were asked, are they the same? She'd say, of course not. Um, yeah, and, and you're certainly correct that. Uh, these are names for individuals that um, appreciating the names isn't automatically going to enable you to recognize the identity. Right? You need further information. You have to be enlightened in some way. Uh, that's not quite the difference. That is, that is how you get these kinds of interesting identity statements. Because um, saying Superman is Superman isn't very interesting. That's an identity statement. Everyone who, uh, everyone's in a position to appreciate. Um, you don't need to do extra research to know that that's true. Uh, but there's a different difference. Yeah. Can it be that the third one or the third person said it occurs in the most obvious, uh, whereas the later one is a sort of phenomenon? Uh, so the first part's right. So yeah, so the Earth, Superman, Clark Kent, Batman, Bruce Wayne, so on. Uh, these are all identity claims about individuals individuals. Uh, the last two are not claims about individual things. They're claims, they're identity statements about kinds, right? Uh, heat is a kind of thing. Uh, light is a kind of thing. Um, to say heat is identical with uh, molecular motion isn't to say anything about any particular instance of heat or molecular motion. So these are identities of kind. So they're, it's abstract, right? Um, you could be in a world where there's no heat, and it would still be true that heat is molecular motion. Um, well, I guess the same is true of Superman, Clark Kent. Right? They don't exist, yet the identity uh, is true. There are funny philosophical questions about fictional truths, but don't worry about it. Properties of identity, numerical identity. Uh, identity is what's called a reflective, symmetric, and transitive relation. 
Um, rela relations that have all three properties are called equivalence relations. Uh, here's what it is to say that a relation is reflexive. Uh, it stands in the relation to itself. So the identity relation is a relation that everything bears to itself. You are identical to yourself. Um, there's other things that have the same property. Being the same age as, right? You have a certain age and you have the same age as yourself. Um, you have a height and you are just as tall as yourself. Right? These are relations you stand into yourself. Right. Um, a symmetrical relation is a relation such that if one thing bears it to another, then the other thing bears it to it. Right. So being punched is not a symmetrical relation. Right? You can be punched by someone and not punch them back. But being married to someone is a symmetrical relation. If you're married to someone, then someone, that same someone's married to you. Uh, identity is also symmetric. You're identical to yourself, and yourself is identical to you. Um, Clark Kent is identical to Superman. Superman is identical to Clark Kent. But here's the big one. Here's the one that matters for our present discussion. It's the transitivity of the identity relation. Uh, transitive relations go like this. If A stands in the relation to B and B stands in the relation to C, then A stands in the relation to C. Um, so being part of something is like this. If my fingernail is part of my hand and my hand is part of my arm, then my fingernail is part of my arm. Parthood is a transitive relation. Uh, being taller than is a transitive relation. If you are taller than me, and I'm taller than Andy, then you're taller than Andy, right? Um, identity is like this as well. Um, if Superman's identical to Clark Kent, and Clark Kent is identical to the person Lois Lane loves, then Superman is identical to the person Lois Lane loves. Uh, this is a fact about the identity relation. Um, so anything that flies against this fact um, is going to be problematic. And what we're going to see later on is that uh, certain answers to questions about personal identity run into problems with the transitivity of the identity relation. Any questions about these three relations? You don't have to remember that they're an equivalence relation. The, the primary thing to remember is the transitivity bit. That's, that's where the action is going to be. One last thing about identity, something that you're aware of because we talked about it earlier on uh, when we talked about logic, when we talked about time travel, and it has to do with Leibniz's law. Uh, Leibniz's law says that if two things are identical, they have everything in common. Right? If A is identical to B, then there's nothing true of A that's not also true of B. So if Clark Kent's identical to Superman, then if Superman has a height, Clark Kent has the same height. If Superman can fly, Clark Kent can fly. Everything true of one is true of the other. This will also be important. Um, one way in which this fact about identity is useful is that if you're able to isolate a difference between two things, then you know automatically they can't be identical. Right? They can't be the very same thing. Um, and again, this other fact about identity will emerge with some importance. All right. So uh, here's what we've done. Uh, I, <laughs> I introduced an interesting question. What makes you the same person over time? Uh, I drug you through this material about identity. All right. So let's now, let's now see what kind of answers we get to this question. Um, what kind of answers we get? All right. John Locke gives a particular and pretty intuitive answer. John Locke lived quite a while ago. Um, and his first observation was this. Uh, whenever we, we don't just ask questions about identity of persons, right? Um, my bike, right? My uh, wife bought that for 40 bucks on Craigslist in New York when she was living there. 
um, it's undergone the replacement of many parts. Uh, there are parts of it that are being hung on with duct tape right now. Uh, uh, I might get those fixed. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I'll certainly replace it at some point in time. But it's undergone a lot of changes, yet it's my bike. Right? Um, there's true identity claims about my bike over time. Um, bears, right? What makes something the same bear over time? Uh, we assume that, you know, if you had a cub and you raised it, it will have undergone a lot of changes, and yet it will still be the bear that you had when it was baby bear. Um, right? For any kind of thing, we can ask about its identity conditions over time. Right? So Locke says, well, first of all, we, we need to ask, when we're asking about personal identity, we need to specify, well, what in the world is a person to begin with? In giving identity conditions for persons or kinds of things, it matters what kind of thing it is. Right? Uh, what explains the fact that a bear is the same bear over time, or a puppy is the same dog over time, it's going to be different than what explains the fact that my bike is the same bike over time. Right? Uh, both endure changes of parts, right? cells in the puppy and the bear replace. Um, but that's not at all like what happens when I change parts on my bike. One is a very organic, natural process, uh, very inorganic and unnatural process when I replace parts on my bike. Yet it's still my bike. Um, so the explanation for the identity of the two things is going to be different. So what's distinctive of persons? Well, here's what Locke has to say about persons. It'll ring bells, because it's a lot like what Descartes says. Um, a thinking, intelligent being that has reason and reflection and can consider itself as itself, the same thinking thing in different places and times, um, which it does only by that consciousness which is inseparable from thinking and, as it seems to me, essential to it. The guys who were writing in the 1600s didn't always write in the clearest of terms for us. Um, basic thought. Um, a person is a conscious being that can consider itself as, its, uh, as a self over time and has properties uh, having reason and reflection. Right. But core point, uh, being conscious of oneself, right? being able to think of yourself as a self and being able to think of yourself as a self at different points in time. This is what it is to be a person. All right, so uh, first off, it's obviously going to follow from this, if it's true of personhood, that one person is the same as another, just in case they're the same conscious being. Right, if consciousness is what makes for persons, then to be the same person at two times, you have to be the same conscious being at two times. Now, um, here's a concern. Consciousness is episodic. Right? Uh, it's something you have at the time you're having it. Right? You're now conscious of your present experiences. You're not now conscious of your past experiences. Right? You're not now experiencing your breakfast. You're not now tasting your oats or whatever you ate. Uh, you're not now uh, tasting whatever you had to drink last night. You're not now tasting yesterday's coffee. Right? Uh, your conscious experiences are limited to what you're presently experiencing. So we have this question. How could you be the same person over time if consciousness is limited to times. Well, here's what Locke says. Um, for since consciousness always accompanies thinking and it is that that makes everyone to be what he calls self and thereby distinguishes himself from all other thinking things, in this alone consists personal identity. That is, sameness of rational being. And as far as this consciousness can be extended, 
uh, extension of consciousness, backwards to any past action or thought, so far reaches the identity of that person. It is the same self now as it was then, and it is by the same self with this present one that now reflects on it that that action was done. All right. Um, <clears throat> Locke talks about the extension of, of consciousness. How, how can consciousness be extended? Well, um, how we tend to read Locke is just in terms of memory. Right? You're not now conscious of what you had for breakfast. You're not now conscious of the taste of the oats, of the milk on your tongue, whatever. Um, but you can recall it. Right? You can remember the experience. Right? Memory gives you access to past conscious episodes. All right, so memory tethers you in. It links you up with. It binds you to your earlier selves. Right. So a picture that very naturally emerges from these thoughts of Locke is this. Um, to be the same person over time is to remember the past experiences of yourself over time. A at a later stage is the same person as B at an earlier stage, just in case, uh, if and only if. A remembers experiencing the things experienced by B. Um, how do you feel about the picture? All right. Memory loss is a problem for Locke. Memory loss is a problem. Well, that'll be the first objection we come to. So I'll just go, come back to it. All right. Sounds like you guys are comfortable with the. Yeah. No, because they'd still be, uh, yeah, so time travel does add complications to the story. Uh, ha, ha, uh, banning time travel makes things a bit neater. Uh, first of all, the relevant concept of time, if time travel is possible, isn't going to be external time, uh, but it's going to be personal time. And uh, the, the, it'll still be true that um, the time travel traveler is a later self, even though they're at the same external time as the earlier self just that earlier and later have to do with the personal time of the time traveler. Um, uh, and again, the, the notion of um, personal time is a, a sort of, it's a causal notion. Uh, so the, the time traveler stands causally downstream and his perspective on sort of, well, let me just pause. He stands causally downstream of his earlier self. And that's really what's relevant. But Locke didn't have thoughts about time travel in mind. Uh, uh, we, I don't think we get our first time travel novel until the 1800s. So um, uh, this wasn't in uh, 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 an issue Locke was dealing with. But we, we could fairly easily fix the, the complications time travel brings up. All right. First question, before we assess, uh, turn, to, turn to challenges, um, we want to know, well, what speaks in favor of this? Why well, think this is true, right? Locke's given us a theory, but not every theory is true. So why think this one's true? Well, here are two uh, pieces of data. Um, first off, uh, it's possible for people to swap bodies or to immediately have entirely different bodies and remain the same person. It's also possible for two people to occupy the same body. All right, so um, let me ask, uh, are, are you inclined to agree with this? All right, so just gut reaction, if, if you had to say yes or no now. Uh, are you inclined to agree? 
Now, remember, this isn't like actually possible, like science can do this, right? There's no, you can't go to a different department on campus and have them do this for you. This is a claim about uh, possibility in a broader sense, right? There's no contradiction involved. Um, and uh, so, oh, so don't think uh, if I say, yeah, it's possible, I'm talking about what could be done in my lifetime or anything like that. So what do you, what do you think? Are you inclined to agree? Why don't you turn to the person next to you? Register your thoughts. All right. How do you feel about these two data points? All right, uh, so I'm, I'm curious uh, where you're at. How do you feel with these possibility claims? Uh, would you raise your hand if you feel like, yeah, that's possible in some broad sense of possibility? All right, so half of you, the other half seem a little cagey. Um, the, the half that's less, less, more reluctant, um, less inclined to think this is actual data. Uh, any quick thoughts as to why? Like what, what your hesitation is? Like, it, it worries you that, like, you might, like, cons it, it's possible that, I don't know, God could zap you into another body or something. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a lot of things in life that are creepy and nevertheless actual. Um, this isn't even a claim about actuality, right? Just possibility. Uh, notice that um, you tacitly give your consent to these data points all the time. When you watch movies uh, or read stories where this occurs, um, so 13 going on 30, if memory serves, uh, you've got this kind of phenomenon. A 13-year-old gets a 30-year-old body. Uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So that's one person having an entirely different body. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Two different people who at different times occupy the same body. Um, and Dr. Who, right? That's one person who uh, whenever one body is about to give it up, he just gets a new rejuvenated body, right? entirely different from the previous one. And we don't, we don't fuss with this. I mean, most people watch this and think, oh, that's, that's, they, they just don't, they don't stop and think, oh, that's, that's nonsense, plot hole, right? No, no one's saying that, um, no one's saying that, right? And that, that sort of tacit acceptance is, you know, a little bit of evidence that we're inclined to think this is true. And Mock's theory can do uh, uh, the, the job of explaining this, why this is possible. If Mock's theory is correct, then what physical body you have doesn't matter for personal identity over time. It matters to whether or not he says you're the same animal over time, you're f that you have the physical, same physical body. But it doesn't matter for being the same person. So his theory does a great job of explaining these two supposed data points. What kind of argument is this? Anybody recall from week on logic? We had deductive, we had inductive, and we had inference to the best explanation. Right? This is the pattern of inference you get in science. Right? You have a hypothesis that explains a lot of data. Great reason to think the hypothesis is true. Same kind of argument here, right? Just same pattern of reasoning. We got a hypothesis that explains stuff. That's a reason in favor of the hypothesis. All right. Um, before we talk about challenges, um, we need to clarify one thing uh, about the nature of memory, right? Locke says that what it is for you to be the same person over time is for you to remember 
past conscious experiences of yourself. Um, is it possible to have false memories? Can you have false memories? All right, so uh, think about Quaid in um, Total Recall. Quaid in Total Recall uh, has false memories implanted on him of getting married. But he was never really married. He uh, just has a, a live-in person who's actually a monitor for a corporation who's tasked to kill him if he, you know, discovers stuff. So he's not actually married to this person. He thinks he's married to. But he has seeming memories. Right? He, he can recall the wedding day, it seems to him, and so on. He has false memories. Um, here, uh, uh, stuff, forget the stuff about Mars. Um, I think that gets the story wrong, if I remember the story right. All right. Um, so here's the question. Does Quaid remember getting married? Does Quaid remember getting married. Here's the challenge I'd like to put to you. Um, an assumption sort of guiding the debate on memory, uh, or certain assumptions about memory. Uh, you can't have false memories. You can seem to remember, but seeming memories aren't genuine memories. What it takes to remember something is for that something to have actually happened. Quay doesn't remember getting married. He seems to remember, but it's a false memory. It's not a real memory. The concept of remembering is factive, in other words. Right. So if you remember doing something, you really did it. Um, now, we speak loosely, right, all the time. Right, when we say, I'm not the same person I was 10 years ago, uh, we're speaking loosely. You're, you're not talking about not being the same person. You're talking about something else. When, you, when we want to say Quaid remembers getting married, the argument is we're speaking loosely. We're not talking about real memories. He, he never was married. He can't remember it. He was never in a chapel. He was never, he, so he had no conscious experience of being in a chapel. Right? He had no conscious experience of saying his vows, of feeling love for this person. Uh, that's all myth, it's all fiction. Right? But it, it seems to him as though he remembers. And we speak loosely all the time because it's more convenient, it's shorter. Um, so we say it's not a real memory. All right, so that raises the question, what does it take to have the real thing? What does it take to have the real thing? Here are three conditions. Um, First condition, uh, the individual who actually remembers, who has a genuine memory, has to be inclined to believe that they had the experience. If you genuinely remember having coffee with breakfast this morning, then you have to be at least inclined to believe it. Right? If you're not even inclined to believe it, it's very difficult to see how you can be said to remember, right? This sounds really weird. Um, I remember having coffee for breakfast, um, but I'm not at all inclined to believe I did. Uh, that should sound off. And the off-soundingness is a bit of evidence for thinking that the concept of remembering involves being inclined to believe what you remember occurring. You with me? Make sense? Right. So the way to put pressure on the, the, the assertion I'm making right now um, is, well, can I think of a case where I clearly remember something occurring, but I'm not at all inclined to believe it? Right. That's how you put pressure on this. All right. So any cases come to mind? Um, So the claim is that if you remember, then you're inclined to believe. It's not if you're inclined to believe, then you remember. Yeah. So it's a really important difference. Yeah. All right, so uh, 
it should be hard because, uh, well, philosophers have thought really hard about this, and uh, these are some conclusions they've arrived at. And uh, if they're actually, if it's actually true, then you actually won't be able to successfully think of a counterexample. Here's the second condition, right? It's one we just talked about. Um, you have to act in order to genuinely remember the event has to have occurred. You can't remember having the experience of drinking coffee this morning if you did not actually drink coffee this morning. Right, so this is the factivity condition. And then there's this further condition about, um, so the fact that you had the experience, so the fact that condition two obtains, has to be causally responsible for the fact that you're inclined to believe you had the experience. Um, so uh, you imagine a case where, uh, so think equate again, right? There's machines that could implant false memories in people's heads. Suppose um, his memory is white. This is also something that can happen in that story. So he has no, no more memories. The machine randomly gives memories to Quaid, right? It's just completely arbitrary. One of the memories randomly given to Quaid is the memory of having coffee that morning. All right. But he was also given a memory of like riding a zebra on Mars and um, you know, flying, uh, you know, by flapping his arms and other, like, crazy things. But among the, the memories given is having coffee in the morning. Turns out, he really did have coffee in the morning. So he satisfies the first two conditions. He's inclined to believe he had coffee, and he really did have coffee. Yet, it feels a bit funny to say Quaid remembers having coffee in the morning, because there's not an appropriate connection obtaining between his having the coffee and his inclination to believe he had coffee, right? The reason he's inclined to believe he had coffee is because a machine randomly gave him a memory. And the machine randomly gave him a lot of other memories too, like riding a zebra on Mars. Okay. Uh, if this isn't resonating with you, don't worry about it. There's not a lot of action on the third uh, condition at this point. Um, it will become relevant later on. All right. uh, there's two big objections to Locke's theory. All right, so here, here's the thing. Locke's theory does a great job of uh, explaining uh, or, or our two data points, right? The possibility that you could occupy different bodies very easily and yet remain the same person. That, that your personal identity over time isn't tethered to your actual body. All right. um, I'm not going to read the text just because of time constraints. Let me explain what's going on here. Um, Thomas Reed doesn't like Locke's theory for the following reason. Reed thinks it fails to satisfy the transitivity condition for identity. Here's why. Um, Locke says, uh, memory is what unites you and your past selves. All right, so Reed says, okay, think about this, Locke. Uh, suppose a boy gets flogged, right? He does something he shouldn't have, so he gets beaten. That was acceptable punishment back then, flogging. Um, now, he grows into a man and he uh, captures the enemy's standard. I think that's like an enemy's flag or something. I don't know why you just risk your life to capture an enemy's flag, but um, imagine it's a cool game of capture the flag with the enemy or something. Uh, so he captures the enemy's flag. And when he captures the enemy's flag, that grown individual remembers being flogged as a child. So he is the same person as the person who was flogged as a child because he's linked with that earlier person by way of memory. Suppose this standard capturing adult later becomes a general. He remembers capturing the standard and so he's united with that earlier self by way of memory and so on Locke's 
view, he's going to be the same person as the person who captured the standard, which is intuitive, right? That's the correct result. Uh, he is the same person. Um, but what do we know about the identity relation? It's a transitive relation. If the boy is the same person as the person who captured the standard, and if the person who captured the standard is the same person as the general, then what do we know about the boy? Boy is the same person as the general. But suppose the general forgets being flogged as a boy. Right. Well, on Locke's criteria, he doesn't have the memory relation holding between himself, the general, and the boy. So Locke's theory predicts that he's not the same person as the boy. But that's false. If the boy is the same person as the standard capture and the standard capture is the same person as the general, then the boy is the same person as the general. That's a fact about the uh, identity relation. Right? We can't give that up. Um, so we've got a problem. Locke's theory has the deeply problematic implication that the transitivity of the identity relation fails. That is a terrible consequence. Um, so, Reed says, Locke can't be right. All right. Butler. Butler poses a different objection to Locke. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, what time is it? All right, I'll give the other objection, then I'll take uh, questions. Butler says, whoa, Locke, hold up here. You're explaining personal identity in terms of memory? Wrong move, man, wrong move. Remember condition two of what it takes to remember something? You have to have actually, so if you remember having coffee, then you actually have to have had the coffee. If you remember having coffee, it has to be true that you had coffee. That's presupposing personal identity. That is, that the you who's remembering is the you who had the coffee. Identity is a presupposition of memory. It's like this. Um, you ask, I say, um, uh, so and so's a bachelor. I right, suppose you're not a native English speaker, so you think, well, well what's a bachelor? And I say, well, it's an unmarried male who's a bachelor. I've just explained what it is to be a bachelor in terms of being a bachelor. So I've, that's not an explanation, right? That, that's not, first of all, it's not what a bachelor, I mean, that's not how you analyze the concept of bachelorhood. Uh, the, bachelor, the concept of bachelor isn't to be analyzed in terms of bachelor, it's to be analyzed in other terms. Uh, same thing when we talk about, I mean, it's, this is an analogy, it's not exactly the same, but, but it's analogous to the situation where, that locks in where he's saying, look, memory is what unites you and your earlier selves. But part of what it is to remember something is for you to be the person, it's for you to be remembering earlier things that you did. I, personal identity is already in the mix with the concept of memory. So you can't explain identity in terms of memory. Memory is explained in terms of identity. Right. So Locke's theory can't be right. Okay. Um, so we've got two objections to Locke's theory. Right. Uh, the transitivity objection and then the circularity objection. Um, do you feel like you have a grip on these objections? Would you like me to explain either one of them in more detail or provide other examples? Yeah, yeah, so it's like a child asks you, why is the sky blue? You say, because it's not green. They say, why is it not green? Because it's blue. Uh, you've explained the blueness of the sky in terms of the blueness of the sky. <laughs> uh, that's not an explanation. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's not a, a correct explanation. It's circular. All right. So here's the puzzle. Uh, the memory answer is pretty good insofar as it explains the data. You can, 
your actual body now is not essential to you being the same person over time. You could get a different body and remain the same person. Um, so that's, that's good. But what, what we need is a theory that explains sameness of person over time, how you can be the same person over time, that doesn't run afoul of this transitivity problem and the circularity problem. All right, so that's for next class. How can we overcome these two debilitating objections? All right, we'll see you guys. of your childhood to remember that event. But once you see the picture, you remember. Yeah. Um, the objection only works with um, utter memory loss. So even if you saw the picture, you won't remember it. Yeah. Um, but even that, if you didn't, if you could somehow trace back like a certain behavior pattern to an event, or you could say this behavior pattern generally occurs because of this event. Like that person could see a photo and didn't genuinely remember, but they still act. We still say that you know, they don't have that memory, even if they acted in a way that gave us the idea that they had that memory. Um, well, I, I should think that we should be able to act in ways as if we remember without actually remembering. Mm. Um, the effects of events could linger even if we don't remember the events. Yeah. So, um, so I, I'm not. I don't think this is going to be the, the, the easiest way to say a box <laughs> theory. Yeah. Um, what we're going to see with uh, Harfit is that there's a, a different way of sort of massaging box theory that doesn't require remember having all the same memories, but that there's a kind of continuity of remembering. Yeah. So it allows for memory loss, uh, just so long as each adjacent temporal yeah. part um, has enough of the memories of the earlier. That was, the, sorry, you don't have time, but that was the other problem I had, was, I don't, I, I get what you mean about there's no false memories, mm -hmm. but that seems to run into a problem when I think of a collective false memory. So if a collective group of people have a singular false memory, and there's no other to try and contrast that with, like it seems to say, a collective false memory can't exist implies that there is another that is I'm happy to keep talking. Do you mind if we just walk out? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's going to be hard for me to get my mic. I'm going to be a little bit more.